One of the most fundamental problems in modern server communication can be reduced to burgers. Back in the day, I worked at a small burger joint. Yeah, flipping burgers, just like the rest of us when this thing takes over. It was a small place with order incoming every 15 minutes. The manager would take the order and basically scream it at the cook. Big Mac, Big Mac. For a while, it worked, but over time, we became popular. More people came in, multiple orders taken, and meals started fading away from memory. That's HTTP in a nutshell. You throw a message at something, but nothing's guaranteed. If someone picks it up, perfect. If not, it's lost. That's where queues come in, allowing you to both create a persistent list of orders, but also go back in time and review what happened. Now, see, just the queue is nice, but you don't need anything fancy for that. It's when you need more than one queue, create priority, handle scale of requests, and being able to actually serve different endpoints or different people in the back kitchen to stay with the burgers analogy, this is where real systems come in. This feature is usually called PubSub in the industry, and you'll hear many explain it as an upgraded post office or a group chat, if you will. You send a message, someone else makes sure it's delivered, and many people can register to view these messages, kind of like joining a group chat or a Slack channel to see all the relevant published announcements. Those of you who built systems in the past are probably already mumbling Kafka or managed solutions like SNS or SQS, but I... But I come in peace. Seriously, if you like paying for a service you can't use locally, go right ahead. Or if you like to handle Kafka's operations, I won't stop you from shooting your own foot. Right. RabbitMQ is designed for everything above, it's open source and written in Erlang, a fact making it both scalable to millions of threads, fault tolerant and easy to distribute on a cluster of nodes. The best thing for us is that it's sold by cloud providers, so that when you do want to take the leap and use a managed service, you can easily migrate to the cloud. More about that later. RabbitMQ has been around for a while. It's been so long that you'll see it's by VMware, which itself is by Broadcom, and these guys are connecting everything. Nah, I'm joking, they're also doing AI. Rabbit, one broker to queue them all. Free and open source, flexible and durable, but most importantly, in my opinion, one of the best pieces of tech, deserving of the cliche, where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Erlang and its framework OTP are a major powerhouse of the world's telecommunication networks. OTP literally stands for Open Telecom Network and is designed for concurrency at scale, fault tolerance, real-time latency and hot upgrades. In other words, Kevlar bulletproof. Started in 2007 in its own little company called Rapid Technologies, acquired by VMware Division three years later, then sold and became part of Pivotal after another three, then acquired back by VMware in 2019. Busy life, eh? Well, two years ago, VMware got acquired by Broadcom for 69 billion US dollars and the rabbit found itself changing hands again. Okay, enough with business talk, it's dirty hands time. That sounded worse than I expected. Anyway, install RabbitMQ. With Homebrew, you can actually run it as a background managed service. Once running, the first gateway is the web UI at the default port 15672. It's important to mention that 5672 is the communication port for Rabbit. If you try RabbitMQ, then tab to complete, you'll notice a bunch of tools. I really have no idea why they're not combined into one parent utility, and one can only imagine its legacy and segregation of processes. But anyway, we'll be mostly using Rapid MQ admin, starting with declaring a queue. You know, for our burger joint, a queue of orders. This usually comes with a name and other parameters. Queues can be durable or transient. What this basically means is that durable queues metadata will be stored on disk, hence surviving broker reset, while transient queues metadata will be kept in memory and evaporate with resets. Our orders queue has to be durable in this use case. The next step is to simply publish a message by telling it what exchange to use, which is kind of like a router. We'll get to that, but the routing key is orders, then sending our payload. Our queue is in the UI and the message is shown as well in the counter. We can run a get command through the UI too to read messages. Unless told otherwise, a message isn't taken out of the queue when read. This is an important concept in modern queues, where you both want to process a message and then tell the queue that you're done. Otherwise, you'd want someone else to pick it up if you've stopped. In our burger joint, an order can be picked up by someone in the kitchen, which is then called to put out a fire in the oven. We still don't want the order to get lost, so it'll find itself back in the queue. 
To get the most out of your message broker like RevitMQ, you need an environment that provides dedicated resources and absolute stability. That's exactly why I've partnered with Hostinger for this video. Starting December 29th, Hostinger is running a massive sale. If you want to go to their VPS page and check out the KVM2 plan, it's currently discounted by 61%, bringing it down to just $6.99 a month. This plan is my personal favorite and offers an excellent balance of price and resources to give you some perspective. A similar setup elsewhere could cost you roughly seven times that amount. And that's even without counting the network bandwidth. If you want some fun, go check out how much a terabyte of data transfer costs you on an EC2 instance and let me know. The KVM2 plans runs on AMD Epic processors and NVMe SSDs, ensuring high performance and low latency for your message brokers or any other service. Here's how to secure the best deal. One, select the KVM2 plan for 24 months duration to locking that 6.99 pricing. Then head over to the card and type in the coupon called DevOps Toolbox. This gets you an additional 10% discount on top of the already massive sale. Once you check out, the onboarding is seamless, but the feature I use the most is a Docker Compose Manager. Yes, instead of manual configuration, I can just paste my Compose file right into the dashboard and Hostinger deploys the project for me in one click. Click the link in the description and remember to use DevOps Toolbox for the extra discount. Big thanks for Hostinger for sponsoring and supporting the channel. Now, back to the video. To show some traffic, we can loop through some published requests from a shell script. Mind you, this isn't a very robust test. These are all HTTP requests waiting for responses too, but we just want to see the UI graphs picking up traffic. We can also create some parallelism to push it a tiny bit higher. Again, nothing in Rabbit's terms, but still. We can also use the admin utility to get a quick view into the queue. And thanks RabbitEvs for the table, but as a new shell user, I'd appreciate it if you left the data visualization to me. They did, however, add a straightforward way to keep only wanted fields, like when listing queues, I can pick just the name and messages columns, which is thoughtful. Do note the current message number at 8,870. Now let's get 10 orders from the queue and do something risky in terms of flow by mentioning ACK mode to be requeue false. Basically telling the queue this order is processed the second I consumed it. Not a great practice, but in some cases it does make sense. Some messages should be read once and once only. And while this response is a bit broken, orders are fetched and the first one with the cheeseburger says true under redeliver, meaning this is not the first time this message is read since we did get it earlier using the UI. Just to confirm the fact that messages were truly not requeued, we had 8870 earlier and now fetching 10 with non requeued ACK mode, we have 8860. So far, simple concepts. It's time to show some real rabbit muscle. Earlier, we published messages telling them to use a default exchange. It's time to create our own exchange, but why? A RabbitMQ exchange can be thought of as a load balancer or more precisely a router, receiving messages from producers and routing them to one or more relevant queues. Why do you need them though? Well, the first general purpose known to most queue users is dead letter queue or DLQ in short. That is like a waste basket for failed slash problematic messages. We declare an exchange similar to a queue. Name it and give it a type. In this instance, direct is a proper router, but exchanges can also be used for topics, fanout and other options. We'll talk about that later. Then we need a queue to send these dead letter messages to. In our burger joint, these would be sent to the manager's desk to decide how to handle rather than keeping our kitchen busy with nonsense. The last piece of the puzzle is binding, declaring the dead letters as a source and the manager's desk as a destination with safe orders as a routing key, meaning safe orders will be our filter rule deciding where the message goes. We'll declare a safe orders queue with an argument of X dead letters exchange set to dead letters so that failures will automatically go to that exchange and route it from there. At first, we process a message from the safe orders queue. We'll artificially send a reject response to Rabbit setting requeue to false. Rabbit understands there is a processing failure. The message is rerouted there to the manager's desk. Now, we process a message from the manager's desk and there's our concrete block waiting here instead of interrupting our kitchen. Nice, we can now fan out failures to a separate line, but what if these are not failures, but rather different places or queues these messages should end up? For example, at our burger restaurant, what if we could automatically send some orders to the burger chef, but fries or chips will go to the deep fryer person in the kitchen? But that's not all. How about we do that automatically in the system? Check this out. We start by an exchange to route messages. In this instance of type topic, allowing us to use pattern matching to decide on a routing key. 
we'll add two queues, a fry queue and another one for the grill. Both are ready, so let's declare them binding and this is the interesting bit. From the orders topic, we'll send messages to the fry queue if it answers the pattern of order burger something or to the fry if it's order something fries. We'll send one burger request with order.burger.cheese as the routing key and another with order side fries. Onto the queues, where one message was sent to the fry and another to the grill. Now that the setup is ready to serve millions of burgers, it's time for my one favorite command, which is a bit anticlimactic. RapidMQ CTL status sends a list of unparsed metrics with everything you need to automate monitoring and alerts. From memory pressure through disk, connections, listeners broken down with protocols, busy queues, reads, writes, even file descriptors. The last bit on the status list is available plugins, which is a great segue to Rabbit extensions. There's a nice list of plugins you can add, the most famous of which are the Shovel plugin, which by its name you can guess how it picks and throws messages in one direction from a source to a destination. The other is Federation, which I hope no one official is listening to my description, but it's like a shovel glued to a tractor, lifting and moving messages across different Rabbit clusters. Enabling a plugin is simple with the plugin utility. In this instance, I'll use the top plugin, adding extra metrics from monitoring, which you know I love. That's it. In the UI under admin, there are now processes broken down even further with memory consumption and status, giving you further debugging context for real hard workload. The last bit is taking our burger restaurant to a real scale and nothing screams scale like clusters, right? And if you think this burger example for infra in high scale is far-fetched, I want to inform you that Chick-fil-A had almost 3000 distributed Kubernetes nodes and that's 2023. It's probably way more by now. I'll leave a link for the article below because I want to show you how easy it is to run Rabbit at scale in a cluster that can easily grow. Something that's hard to say about Kafka, for example. You can find me in the comments. In the meantime, Minikube start for a local Kubernetes mini cluster. And while there are multiple options out there, I'm going with the official Rabbit MQ cluster operator for Kubernetes. One kubectl apply and it's running. Then we create a simple custom resource called Rabbit MQ Cluster and give it the terrible name definition while also misspelling cluster in the file name. Let's apply, get all the objects named definition, and there we have a pod initializing and two services so that we can interact with the rabbit. Notably, there's also a stateful set making the rabbit setup persistent with an attached disk. This isn't a Kubernetes video, I have a full introduction to Kubernetes course in the description. The point here is clustering. The log say it's ready, so let's first port forward to the UI and see that we can log in. Logging requires a bit of hacking if you're like me and RTFM never applies to you, so hiding in opaque secrets, which I then have to decode with base64, are both the user and the password, and once these two are in, we're in. Now, only one node below, let's see what it takes to scale up, or out rather. So we're editing the RabbitMQ cluster object, changing the replicas from one to three, saving, and we have two new definition servers initializing. Monitoring the logs, we can see that they're both started. So go to the UI and what do you know, two new nodes join the system. For those of you seeing this and saying, what the hell does this nerd want? He scaled it up, so it's scaled. I invite you to do the same with raw Kafka or just raw rabbit servers, making sure these things join the cluster, understanding who is the leader, who are the followers, how to apply failover and more is such a pain in the butt that looking at this thing just performs what I've been fighting with for a decade is pure wizardry. You're almost a rabbit expert now, or at least a step closer to knowing better options the next time you build a system architecture. And if you like the open source nature and versatility of rabbit, it pairs beautifully with Postgres. So much so that PG can actually serve as a pubs of itself and a message queue. Not as good as rabbit, but pretty damn great. Don't believe me? Watch this video next. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.